This is the last of um, roadblocks to Republic. And chronologically, this would make it the last one. Uh, but this is a, f a fascinating topic. Again, many Americans don't seem or have never heard of this or maybe have forgotten it. The uh, Lewis Powell Memo. Things about 34, 36 pages. So obviously here I can't print that out for a handout for everybody. But you can find it online easily enough, the Lewis Powell Memo. Or as it was called by Powell when he wrote this to the Chamber of Commerce. That's what this was addressed to. Uh, Mr. Eugene P. Sidnor, Jr., Chairman, Educate, get this, the Education Committee, U.S. Chamber of Commerce, from Lewis, L. Lewis F. Powell, Jr., who, by the way, was an Associate Justice on the Supreme Court. Now I can go back to, somebody brought up Kavanaugh before. And uh, this is dated August 23, 1971, and it's the official name, and it's called a Confidential Memorandum. Confidential Memorandum, subtitle, Attack on American Free Enterprise System. Now, be aware of the time here, 19, August 1971. Uh, by this point, you know, the Nixon administration, uh, you know, you're beginning to, you're going to be getting into this Watergate situation pretty soon. On top of that, things aren't going too well in Vietnam. This is 1971, and already in January, you know, uh, you, you, <laughs> uh, the, the, the North Vietnamese are really pressing the case here, and so by January 1973, you know, we make that agreement, we're going to get out, and then two years later, you know what happens after that, North, the South Vietnam falls prey to the North. But the fact of the matter is, we're not doing too well in Vietnam, things aren't going all that great. And on top of that, through the 50s and the 60s, you had the Civil Rights Movement. And if you remember, some of you remember in the 60s, weren't there a lot of our cities in the throes of uh, riots and demonstrations and so on and so forth? And then to add to that, you had the anti-war movement gathering steam during the 60s. I'm talking like 1965 on, and especially by 67, 68, and 69, they're out in the streets. Even water, even uh, Woodstock, 1969. And at the same time, and Lewis, Paul, and Lewis Paul focuses more on this, I'm just providing a backdrop, uh, that many academics, to him, many academics and students, especially in, in college, universities, are questioning capitalism. Questioning capitalism. And interesting where, interesting where Lewis Powell takes this. Dimensions of the attack. Get this. No thoughtful person can question that the American economic system is under broad attack. And there's a, a footnote here variously called the free enterprise system, capitalism, and the profit system. The American political system of democracy under the rule of law is also under attack, often by the same individuals and organizations who seek to undermine the enterprise system. This varies in scope, this broad attack. Intensity in the techniques employed in the level of visibility. Now, <laughs> Interesting here, he adds, there have always been some opposed to the American system and preferred socialism or some form of statism such as communism and fascism. That did exist. Go back to what I mentioned last week with the uh, business plot. Uh, these, guys, these guys weren't collecting for the Red Cross, obviously, here. And now, you know, he, he begins the sources of his attack. They include, not unexpectedly, the communists, new leftists. Remember the SDS? Students for a Democratic Society. Hmm. And other revolutionaries who would destroy the entire system. 
And he says the extremists on the left are far more numerous and better and better financed and are increasingly more welcomed and encouraged by other elements of our society. Now that's an interesting perspective considering this is 1971 when it seems like the White House, because of the Vietnam War, seems to be being besieged. I mean, if you remember, going back to the late 60s, 1970, 71, weren't there people uh, riot, uh, demonstrating in front of the White House? And not just two, three, or four, or not just a few dozen. Hundreds, thousands of them. And some of them were what? Returning vets. I mean, it seems like they're calling into question the edifice of America. Wow, that's pretty heady stuff. It really is. You know, you can understand then his concern to a certain extent from his perspective here. And he gets in here, interestingly enough, the most disquieting voices joining the chorus of criticism come, perfectly respectable, come from perfectly respectable elements of society. The college campus, the pulpit, the media, the intellectual and literary journals, the arts and sciences, and from politicians. Interesting here is, this is what the McCarthy hearings were, I have in my note here, this is what the McCarthy hearings were convened for to purve the providence-ordained America of any socialist communist strain. And so, in fact, haven't you heard today from some people that they think this is the era of McCarthyism again? I know I've read that. Interesting where this goes. Interesting where this goes. And he says, now understand this one. This one is fascinating. One of the most bewildering paradoxes of our time is to the extent in which the enterprise system tolerates if not participates in, his own in its own destruction. This is right out of the Communist Manifesto, where Marx wrote, Marx and Engels wrote, that the, that the capitalists will give them just enough rope to hang themselves. Interesting where the Lewis Paul memo, from a different perspective, kind of reaches a junction with Karl Marx and, and Frederick Engels in an 1848 manifesto. There's over a decade, there's over a century and a half separating the two of them. And he says the campuses, interestingly enough, from which much of this criticism emanates, are supported by one, tax fund funds generated largely by American business, and two, contribution from capital funds controlled and generated by American business. The boards of trustees of our universities overwhelmingly are composed of men and women who are leaders in the system. That's an interesting analysis. That's an interesting analysis. They're still giving money to these universities and colleges, as he suggests, but they're taking it on the chin from criticism from these same institutions. Is virtually what he's saying here. Go back to, go back to, if not participating in its own destruction. Wow. Interesting. The tone of the attack is very much, is very much, uh, you know, it's, it's draconian here. And one of the people he, he has here uh, slated for criticism uh, is William Kunstler. Remember him? Oh, yeah. He says, William Kunstler is warmly welcomed on campuses and listed in a recent student poll as, in quotes, the American lawyer most admired. Incites audiences with, the follow with something like, you must learn to fight in the streets, to revolt, to shoot guns. We will learn to do all the, th all the things that property owners fear. Supposedly, that comes out of the Richmond News Leader, June 8, 1970, in a column from William F. Buckley. Interesting here, he, said, uh, th th he is one of the new left spokesmen of this backlash to capitalism. Let me go on here. 
Uh, here's the man he here's the man he really really has criticism for, who's still around today, by the way. In fact, I heard him on NPR this morning. Ralph Nader. Yeah, he's got him signal singled out here for choice remarks. Perhaps the single most effective effective antagonist of American business is Ralph Nader, thanks largely to the media has become a legend in his own time and an idol of millions of Americans. In a recent article in Fortune, in Fortune speaks of Nader as follows, the passion that rules in him, and he is a passionate man, is aimed at smashing utterly the target of his hatred, which is corporate power. He thinks and says quite bluntly that a great many corporate executives belong in prison for defrauding the consumer with shoddy merchandise, poisoning the food supply with chemical additives, and willfully manufacturing unsafe products that will maim or kill the buyer. He emphasizes that he is not talking about just fly-by-night hucksters, but top management of blue-chip business. Interesting. This, this, uh, this comes from Fortune, May 1971, page Page 145, this fortune analysis of Nader, Nader's influence includes a reference to Nader's visit to a college where he was paid a lecture fee of $2,500 for denouncing America's big corporations in venomous language, bringing a rousing and spontaneous burst of applause when he was asked when he planned to run for president. $2,500. Hillary gets $212,000 a pop. That's what she averages, you know. $212,000 a pop. Uh, yeah. Well, she's speaking to people who already know what she's going to say. That's called Wall Street. And so the thing here, I can go on with this, but why bother? The thing here is, how does business turn this around? How do they turn it around? And this is the essence of the thing here. This is the essence of the thing here. He blames business for apathy and default. He's got this in a separate column in this thing. He says, they're not prepared for this sort of, as he call it, calls it, guerrilla politics. They're not prepared for this. You think they're taught this stuff? They're not. They're not. He says one of the first things business has to do is to create a position, a special position in the, in, the, in the corporation's hierarchy. The level of a vice president whose sole reason for existence is for, for that corporation to plan its counterattack. In other words, he needs to, he or she, and today he or she would need to be schooled in guerrilla tactics with regards to political economy to carry forward the attack. Interesting what he's thinking here. Absolutely fascinating. Wow, what a document. He also states here, he also states, this is part of the responsibility for, for, uh, for, for business executives. He also states that you actually have a staff for this, but he also states that a stable of speakers must be created. A stable of speakers that will travel the country, going to maybe church groups, libraries, uh, community centers, colleges and universities, They'll have to compete at that time with George Carlin, you know, uh, and other groups like this. A wide variety of venues to deliver the corporate message. That's what he states. And he said the stable of speakers can be put together by corporations. Well, I, well that would be obvious. You're gonna have if you're gonna have boosters of the business message, you gotta they've gotta come from they've got or have be closely affiliated with the corporations. He also states that business 
should take a position in media. Mm -hmm. Should take a position in media. Now, if you take a look at how many owners of media there were, 1970s going into the 1980s, there were 40 or 50 owners of media in this country. And if you owned maybe a newspaper, magazine, or two or three, you couldn't own, depending on where you were, you couldn't own perhaps television or radio stations. Or if you owned a television and radio station, you couldn't own magazine, you couldn't own print media. In other words, they didn't want that unity of opinion. Now, 90, 85, 90% of your media is owned by six corporations. And so when people say, gee whiz, I got a thousand channels. Yeah, watch some of those channels and see, and well, I don't have to go there. I mean, some of these shows are, are really, you know, you know, this uh, Kukla Fran and Ali is shown is, is like it's like it's you know uh, important me important te television here, but he also states interestingly enough they need to take a position in the centers of learning. How about start starting with colleges and universities first on the campus, setting up business chapters in the universities to offset what he says. Are the, are the leftist, leftist um, organizations at some of the colleges and universities. Setting up chapters, or if you want to call them, uh, bases of support for business and so-called free market at the university and college level. And not only that, but beginning to insinuate themselves into high school level. I mean, he's really, he's really thought this out here. But then he also states, there's really only one organization, one organization that can really jumpstart this process here because it has a main headquarters in Washington, D.C. It has an office in, in just probably in every major city in the land, has an office in most large towns or small cities, large towns, even has a, even a, maybe a substation or a very small office in small towns, the Chamber of Commerce. That's why he addressed it to Eugene P. Sidnor, the education chairman of the Chamber of Commerce. He says the Chamber of Commerce can be that locomotive or that base, because it, you don't need to build any offices. You don't really need to be, build any bases. They're already there. It's called the Chamber of Commerce. Interesting. In other words, he's turning the Chamber of Commerce into a common turn for the American corporations, is what he's doing. And he said that stable of speakers can be can use the Chamber of Commerce as a base. Well, who else better to be the base for the speakers? The Chamber of Commerce. And I always liken this to the extent that this really isn't too much different than what the Saudis do with these madrasas in different countries. It's interesting. Madrasas, the common turn by Lenin and the Bolsheviks, it's the same principle, the same exact principle here. He gets to media, and this is interesting. He's concerned about television. He's concerned about that. He's also concerned about the evaluation of textbooks for schools. They are not pro-market, not pro-business enough, perhaps. Go back to, some probably didn't hear this but before you came, but uh, I'm going to be giving a talk on Helen Keller on Sunday as a socialist, and I brought up the fact that in Texas, they're taking her out of the curriculum. Her and Hillary Clinton. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you don't have to be a Hillary fan, but she was, for all intents and purposes, 
the first woman to win the nomination of a large political party. Although Jill Stein did beat her. But that's the Greens. That's not Democrats or Republicans. But Hillary, Hillary really, deep down, is not the first. What would have been interesting is if Eleanor Roosevelt got something like that after the war. Because that was, that was bandied about here, not as a president, perhaps, but as a VP. That would have been huge. 1947, 48, 49? That would have changed the political, uh, the, 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 the political landscape there. Evaluation of textbooks. Equal time on the campus. Where is it? Television. National television networks should be monitored in the same way that textbooks should be kept, up, kept under constant surveillance. This applies not merely to so-called educational programs such as the selling of the Pentagon, but to daily news, and daily news analysis, which so often includes the most insidious type of criticism of the enterprise system. Fake news, somebody just said. And he has, an, he has as an end note, it has been estimated that the evening half-hour news programs of the, of the networks reach daily some 50 million Americans. Whether this criticism results from hostility or economic ignorance, how much is that is, is, is evident today? Economic ig ignorance. Beg your pardon? She says, I think it's extensive. So, there's, a few, there's more than just one person shaking their head, too. All right, she says some of them don't care. Well, I remember when um, the current occupant of the Oval Office won, and you know, they were interviewing some people, I guess, who voted for him, and they said, well, he's a businessman, he'll solve our problems. He's a businessman, he'll, he'll solve our problems. You know, interestingly, maybe I mentioned this here in an earlier talk, but you know, recently, and I did this with the Obama administration, and I think now it's time to say this, uh, you know, when the uh, unemployment rate of 3.9% came out, and I did this when it was 46 with Obama because Himes was giving a, 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 one of those town meetings and brought that up a few years back. And uh, it must be about four years back. And the first thing I did was I went to the Federal Reserve. And I went to capacity utilization, which measures the output of the factories and mines and so on and so forth, right? And capacity utilization, when the 3.9% unemployment rate came out, I went, uh, again, looking at capacity utilization, was 78%. That means 22% of the nation's tables and chairs, te desks, uh, word processors, computers, uh, assembly lines, anything having to do with production, a 3.9% unemployment rate, and 22% of your productive capacity is idle. How does that square? I don't think it does. I don't think it does. So how are we measuring 3.9% unemployment rate? And then if we are measuring it, even if it's correctly, what are the jobs that are coming back? That's the question. And also, how much are they paying? That's another question. And so, are these full-time jobs, or are they like 25, 28 hours a week, or even 30? Full-time employment's what, 35 to 40 hours? How many companies are doing 35 to 40 hours, or avoiding same so they don't have to pay the benefits? That's interesting. But he considers television that new media, that, 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 ex, that really important media. Not to dismiss radio, he says radio is extremely significant. But again, television is significant. And I'm sure, some of, I'm sure many of you know that. Uh, go back to something I mentioned earlier though about Franklin D. Roosevelt. The, mo the, the microphone on the radio helped make Franklin D. Roosevelt. You know, you'd gather around the radio and listen to the fireside chat. 30, 40, 45 minutes, but I mean, you've got, you've got some meat there on, on the, 
I know in your ears, going into your ears here, there's something being said. And I remember as a kid, John Kennedy, now it's television. You're gathered with your mother and father around the television watching Kennedy. Okay, you're not only hearing this, but you're watching this. Now what do you got? Tweets. Streaming, right? But the fact of the matter is, if you're reading tweets, or sometimes even if you're streaming here, are you sitting together with your family to get this? Many people shaking their head no here. And so, you know, it's almost to the, and with tweets, the message is what? 10 words, 12 words, 15 words, maybe 25, right? And so we've gone from the fireside chats to watching Kennedy on TV because, uh, be, because of this new medium of, of, um, of communication on his television. Now we don't have to do that. We now have tweets. And if you noticed where the message goes here, we don't have, it seems, as many press conferences anymore. It's like we're doing away with that or circumventing that, at least with this administration, and with tweets going directly to the recipient instead of having a journalist bring it to you on television, radio, or newsprint. And so, at the same time, there's no questions asked. It's the tweet. I am sending them what I want to send them without the go-between. Yes? Well, you, you know, uh, uh, again, and then again, this is, this is part of this. Uh, Pollock goes in the stable of speakers. Now, one speaker who I think comes to mind here as far as conveying a message is Adolf Hitler. I can imagine what Hitler would have done with tweets. <laughs> and I don't mean that to be funny either. Well, okay. You want to elaborate? There, 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 there's a direction we can go. But, I mean, the fact of the matter is, what did Hitler write in Mein Kampf? He stated that it's the spoken word which galvanizes a public more than the written word. And he says, what you do, and in fact, I've got this in mind, comp, it's fascinating to read. In fact, I'm going to read that book again after I'm done with my, uh, you know, I, I pick out certain books sometimes that maybe I want to read again or read for the first time after I'm done teaching classes and i got more time, and that's going to be one of them. And he states, not only is the spoken word more important than the written word, but you gear that spoken word to the lowest intelligence of the group you're addressing because that way everybody gets it. Now, if you were into, I remember when I was a young Republican and I used to love to watch Firing Line. That was not geared to five-year-olds. In fact, I remember some, my, a friend, a business associate of my father's one time saying, oh, I, you know, here's, a, here's a New York Post. I don't read that paper. How come you don't read that? I said, I don't read newspapers geared to a fifth grade reading level. And so when you look at Firing Line, and I used to love that show, not only just for Buckley, but the guests, the guests, the dialogue that went on here. And, you know, and having been a really young conservative, I look at what passes for conservatism now, you gotta be kidding. But the fact of the matter is, you know, what you see today is what? Simplistic language, some of it gutter, border gutter, to get a message across. Now, how is that supposed to convey an intelligent electorate? Now, that message has gotten very simple. But at the same time, and you can check this if you want, nearly half or about half the American reading public is on an eighth grade reading level or less. That I find fascinating. So is it easier for a message like this to get conveyed when people say, yeah, I wanted to vote for him because he's a businessman, he'll take care of it. I mean, we've always had simple answers on the news. You've seen them for years as to why somebody voted for a certain candidate. But especially now, to me, it's disconcerting. Somebody had a hand. Yes, and then I'll move over. Yeah. Well, you know, when, when, when you go back to this memo and then follow through what has transcribed since, and you see these various initiatives that have followed this, I'll give you one for instance. You know, well, after, the, after this, 
after this memo came out, this is when you began to see many of the so-called conservative think tanks. Cato Institute, mm, Heritage Foundation really, really began to go here. And other so-called conservative think tanks. Uh, you began to see something else come on, come on here because with what, with what he's recommending here, business getting involved in politics directly. If, if you're going to influence position, you got to play in the game. Political action committees. And so this led to what? More money. Well, some people, well, it's, 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 like, it's like revolution. The mass does not or cannot think. Individuals do. They do. Individuals can think. The mass cannot. How many people do you really think on the right and the left that night in Charlottesville were really thinking? You know, and once you're in the heat of the moment, you go. Yet someone standing off to the side, maybe directing some of this, thinks. Go back to, in fact, I did this the other day in my communism class, Lenin. Lenin said, Lenin writes in what is to be done, and that has a bearing on where we're going here. You know, and, and the spoken word, you know, moving masses. That's what he's eventually getting into here, moving masses. And political action committees will do this. Uh, these 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 uh, these uh, conservative think tanks will do this because in the end, some of that, some of these conservative think tanks are drawing up your legislation. Interesting where that goes, but that's coming. Not yet, but it's coming. And so Lenin says, as far as the worker perspective goes, that the worker the worker <laughs> is 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 you know doesn't naturally gravitate to socialism. You know, you've probably heard this too. Uh, the work, the bunch of workers over there forming political, forming a party. Well, they, they, some of them dem used to be the Democrats. Well, they're socialists. Not necessarily. Lenin says not necessarily. They have to be educated that way. And he also states workers, will, workers who want to lead a socialist movement cannot do so unless they become intellectuals. And Lenin states that to really move the workers to a socialist agenda, you have to have, this is, this is in his environment, understand, but maybe he can get out of his environment. He says you have to have, a, you have, to have an intelligent, committed clique of revolutionaries, professional in status, to do this. You can't expect the mass to do this. They have to be led. Interesting here. And so what do you see here? Getting involved in television, getting involved in radio, getting involved in textbooks. In other words, you're the mind. That's what you want to move, the mind. Because if you move the mind, the stomach's going to follow. It is. The stomach will follow. I remember when I played hockey, I had a different, I had a somewhat ag a different agenda. Because when I was playing defense, and I wasn't the fastest skater around, but I found one way to even it up against these speedy skaters. You know, when you start skating backwards, when they're coming in at you, and I never looked at their legs, I never looked at their arms, I never looked at their eyes, their head, their shoulders, because they're trying to juke you. The belt buckle. There's nobody around, I don't care if it's Deion Sanders, who can't go without his belt buckle. I haven't seen that yet. And I used to have the stick way out, and then as they crossed the, the, the blue line, I would pull the stick in a little bit. And so he's going to move in closer to deke and go around. And then I would stop short real fast, come up quick, and my shoulder was right on his jaw. That was a way of me attacking the mind. It worked. It worked. Okay, so in that fashion, you're attacking the mind. Look what you're doing here. 
And so, interestingly enough, you begin to see after this memo, the, you know, these conservative think tanks coming out, political action committees, and Ralph Nader testifies to this. Interesting what Nader says. All through the 70s, representatives and senators, those doors were open to him as a so-called, you know, taxpayer champion, voter champion, getting, isn't he responsible for a lot of clean water, clean air, clean, clean food, fixing cars? Yeah. You think some of these people like that? No. He found that in the, the 1980 and moving on, some of those doors now began to close. Money. That's it. The money began to pour in. That's what Nader said. Even to the point where by 1990, you know what, uh, 2000, you know what's gonna, how, what Democrats are going to do to him by 2000. When Al Gore lost, oh, he lost because of Ralph Nader. Nader got 2% of the vote. If Gore was that good of a candidate, he would have won. Apparently, he wasn't that good. And so Nader takes it on the chin there. But he states how it began to change around 1980. And you can see where the pendulum was going to the extent that by 1997, interesting what you see here, that new plan for the, new, the, plan for the new American century by the neoconservatives. Where, yes, we are, you know, with the collapse of the Soviet, and he can't see the collapse of the Soviet Union here. But it's almost like this is taking a life of its own. You're taking control of the media. You're, you're really establishing a strong, a strong presence in education. How about, again, someone mentioned the money? The money? You're beginning to really assert yourself in the American political structure? Well, then why not just take the country and strengthen Pax Americana? Because that's what it says on page two of the Neocons Military Agenda. You know, the American military during the Cold War was to contain the Soviet Union. On the column next to it, this is on page two. On the column next to it, the 21st century agenda for the American military, Pax Americana. It says it in black and white. Interesting where the country moves from 71 till 2000. Interesting, yes. Some of these neoconservatives are to the right of Attila the Hun. The Richard Pearls, the Douglas Fythes, uh, the John Boltons. Some of these guys who are neo considered neoconservatives, I mean, they're ex really extreme left with regards to foreign policy. And they're, some of them are immensely, immensely pro-Israel. Well, that means they are really, really conservative on an accentuated basis. Like, they, they lean very conservative, like neo-Nazis who, who really lean Nazi or neo-fascist. Some of them are, but the Richard Pearls of this world would like Richard Pearl, Douglas Fife, Wolfowitz was another one. Let's take out Iran, Iraq, Libya, so on and so forth when maybe you got the people like Bannon who would rather see more of a uh, less worldly approach to a more uh, in, uh, inward approach. Yeah, well, some, somehow I don't think Bolton and, and Bannon would have gotten along all that great. Yeah. Well, that, that nuclear weapons was broached in 1954 when the French were surrounded at Dien Bien Phu. Right, right. And so it came up again, apparently. But in 1954, the French were screaming for help. And Arthur Radford of the, Na of the United States Navy, on the Joint Chiefs of Staff, was for it. Uh, Nathan Twining, General of the Air Force on the Joint Chiefs, was for it. Matthew, Matthew Ridgway of the Army was against it. Matt Ridgway was against it. And first, he was against America getting involved in this because of what happened in Korea. And he says, you guys want to cut the army divisions? You want me to get involved in, in Southeast Asia? And he says, that, that's not going to work. And Eisenhower, um, to his credit, stated if we use nuclear weapons here uh, to bomb the North Vietnamese to save the French, we'll have to deny it for 20 years. And he also said, I am not making any move unless I get consideration from Congress. 
In other words, if I don't get a declaration of war, we ain't going. And what happened? Congress did. Korea wasn't all that far away. And it hasn't, wasn't all that long ago. And so we won't get involved in 1954. But it shows you where the country has gone. And then you get to this, when you, you know, the Lewis Paul memo, when you see where the country is going by the late 1960s. Again, with the civil rights movement, the anti-war movement, the young calling into question capitalism. I can't do that. Can't do that. And so this, this, this idea every once in a while of bona fide democracy as opposed to a republic pops up. And there are people who make too much money off the idea of, ha off, off the idea of this republic, which really doesn't exist. Uh, they're, they're, they're gonna, there's going to be a backlash. Well, that's what this Lewis Paul memo represents. Because this sound, you know, when you read this, it doesn't sound, it doesn't sound all that bad. It sounds like, you know, he's putting, he's, Lewis Paul's putting this agenda together for a more even approach. He even states that in here, more even approach. But then again, you get practitioners who go along with this, perhaps. What happens? Take it to the next level, another level after that, another level after that. To the extent that you see the country you have today. Because what eventually follows? I mentioned the plan for the new American century. Now we're in all these wars. What do you have? The Patriot Act. And what's one of those that follows after that, which I know some people probably in this room don't like? Citizens United. Now we're back to the money. And so when you look at Citizens United, take a look at what Nader was saying in 1980. The doors were beginning to close here. Why? And guess what else you're seeing here? Arriving in, num in, in numbers uh, that are, should be a cause for concern. Lobbyists. Now look, at how, now look at the problem you got. And so following the Lewis Paul memo, this all follows in a progression to the extent that since 1971, this is 2018. What's happened over the last 47 years? It's interesting what you've seen develop here. Now, I know during this time frame, during this time frame, you know, 1971, the first time I could vote was 72. And I was a Republican. Well, you know how it went. If you were a Democrat, what'd you do? You became a Democrat because your parents were. If you're a Republican, you're being a Rep Of course, the Republican Party then is not what it is now. And I joined it. And I remember the first time I voted. I didn't vote for Nixon. I voted for McGovern. You voted for a who? Yeah. I said, well, I'd rather vote for the person, not the party. I should have been an unaffiliated from the start. But no, no, I, I stayed Republican. And why would you vote for him for? I said, because of the fact, character-wise, I thought he had more going for him than Nixon did. That was my opinion. I said, the guy was a bomber pilot. He knew what his bombs were doing by 70, you know, the 72 election. Of course, he lost by a lot. I must have been one of the very few Republicans in the state that voted for, for McCarthy. And I, and I don't, and I don't, and I don't, and I don't, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm, no, I don't have any buyer's remorse there either. What a room this is. <laughs> but I remember, too, that as I'm going along here watching, you know, after this, interesting, after this, as, as I'm watching the P Republican Party advance, get to the Reagan years, you're beginning to see, you, you can see where this is going, charted on the ground, not just, not just in print here, but you could chart it on the ground here. I was seeing in the 80s, the, the Republican parties began to take in people I thought uh, were ultra-nationalists, some outright racists, and some who I thought were of questionable religious character. And again, following this progression since 71, but then more realistically from this, perspe from this other perspective here since, since Reagan, uh, the you know, these people do have a right to be heard. It's not that they don't. They have a right to be. If you're letting them in, they have to have a say. Give them their say. However, every time they put up somebody they like, like a Huckabee or a Santorum, the party always had a Reagan, a Bush Sr., a Bob Dole. Remember him? Yeah, of course, he lost to the first real baby boomer president, Bill Clinton. 
But then the party had a, a Bush Jr., a Mitt Romney, a, uh, uh, well, Senator McCain. Uh, and then what? Uh, Jeb Bush tried to grab the nomination last time around and he fell flat on his face. This time it didn't work. That those people that you brought into the party have now think they've had their day. You know, and I remember, I remember years ago, I said, I'm out of here. This, this, is, this is not, this, this ain't what I signed up for. And so when I go back historically and take a look at this, and then I see where that party was, I used to be a member of, see where it's gone? Uh, you know, one and one is two here. And I'm sure there are Democrats in this room who say the, you see the same darn thing I do, but from the perspective of being a Democrat. I mean, they have opted for the touch of mink too. At the same time as the Democratic, what's considered the Democratic Party, is it the party of the working man? Of course not. And so, interestingly enough, if you, if, 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 if you get the time, you can find this online. E you'll find this before you will find the mccormick dickstein Committee I talked about last week. But if you really read this, then, but as you're reading it, you know, think 1971, but also think 2018, what's transpired afterwards. See where this has taken you. It's fascinating. But these, and these political action committees dispensing more and more money, more and more lobbyists, more and more corporate input into media, into education, so on and so forth. Even to the extent where going beyond that, Again, I might have mentioned this last week where Eric Prince broached that idea with the Trump administration about taking all American troops, who you pay for with your taxes, by the way, taking all the American troops out, and that includes the air contingent and replacing them only with private, private contractors. Solely. Solely. So where have we gone since towards the end of Vietnam and the Lewis Paul memo, to now. Citizens United and privatized soldiers? That's not a very good progression here. Yes, and then I'll move up to the back, yes. Well, you know, when, 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 when you bring up somebody like a Patty Hearst, well, it's interesting, you know, what you bring up here, and to a certain extent, you're quite right. I mean, take a look at, at many who formed the hierarchy of the Viet Minh or, or later the North Vietnamese movement here, the Vietnamese people's uh, movement. Um, Ho Chi Minh, uh, Vo Nguyen Giap, uh, Lee Doc To, his brother Mi, people like this, came from families that had scholar officials and were weaned on this mandate of heaven leadership. Take a look at Adolf Hitler. Hitler was middle class. Lenin Lenin was, Lenin was trained to be a lawyer. Um, one of the few that you can mention, top flight names who became these high-flung revolutionaries or leaders is out of Western Europe, uh, out of the European situation at least, is Stalin. His father was a cobbler. You know? And, and so you see many of these so-called revolutionary leaders come from Lower or middle, lower middle class, middle class. And that's no accident, because some of these people can what? Think. And go back to what I mentioned about Lenin. You know, workers can't become socialists unless they become intellectuals. How many workers are going to become intellectuals? You don't have the time for it. She's shaking her head no. And so go back to what I mentioned earlier. You need a concerted clique of professional revolutionaries to lead them. Okay, what do you got here? You've got business that's going to lead this. Is that the entire population? No. Is it a large group? Yes. Is it, on the surface here, seem like it's decently organized? Yes. It's a good program. It's a good program if you're looking to change the narrative to benefit more yourself, yourself or your faction. Yeah, it is. It is. And so when you take a look at this and then see what transpired in the decade, years and then decades afterwards, it's fascinating what you see. But read that first. It's fascinating. Yes. 
He really doesn't mention the Vietnam War, but as a backdrop here, because some of these people protesting the Vietnam War were protesting capitalism, or what they call the, the, the perverted use of it. And that can't fly. That can't fly. Yeah. They're, right now, they're too, well in, uh, too, too endemic in your system to get rid of them now. Unless you want to blow up the whole system. 53.3. Right. 46.7 stayed home. Right. And a lot of those that stayed home were who? Younger. Yeah. Uh, and I think that came as a result of um, not all of it, but I think a noticeable amount came when Sanders lost the nomination. I you know, well, Christmas, this isn't who I want, so why bother? And because David Rothenberg, that, that publicist in New York, uh, produ producer Broadway on Broadway, he has a radio show on Saturday mornings. Occasionally I put him on. And he was volunteering his time to register young people to vote for what's coming up in a few weeks. And he said for every 25-year-old who signed up, there was a 25-year-old that said, why bother? It's not going to make any difference. Well, political action committee, you're giving to a party, perhaps, um, like a, well, whatever Republican or Democrat. Well, they're the bag man or a lady. That's, that's, that's what the lobbyist is. I mean, I, I, read, read a couple of these books by lobbyists. Or one of them is called Payoff. That's an interesting book. And um, he, was a, he was one of uh, the advisors of Joe Biden, who he didn't have much good to say about. Yeah, he says he's really not the nice guy some people think he is. And um, behind the scenes anyway. And, uh, you know, he got fed up with it and got out. Uh, he says it's really not American politics. But I mean, when, when you look at him as a, put, I mean, even Democrats, some Democrats have brought him up for 2020. And I'm thinking, here's a guy who's run twice, can't win a state. That's all you got? Yeah, what I, if, if I'm understanding what you're saying and, and you're bringing out something pretty deep, which is fine, I, li I like that stuff. No, I think by conscience, a, a societal conscience, despite the individuals, the societal conscience, if you have a society that has certain mores, uh, if you have somebody who seems like they're operating uh, in opposition to those mores, perhaps that person is, 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 is a little loose here. That societal pressure will put them back in line. That's if you have that. If you have a fractured society, then perhaps you will get more of those people you might consider a little loose. <laughs> well, rogues, Yes, but then again, are you becoming too individualistic and less cohesive as a society here? Is that what's happening? Because if that's what's happening, uh, where are you going as a so-called nation? As a culture, as a society, uh, are you seeing a breakdown perhaps in societal standards and, 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 a, and a decline in culture. Yeah, well, I, I, I think it's like anything else. Well, go back to what I, I mentioned earlier about uh, technology and certain politicians like Franklin D. Roosevelt, the microphone, and the radio. That, where you had mom and, mom and dad sitting around with a uh, child or two, as a family sitting in front of the radio. You can't see anything except the radio. RCA Victor on the front of the radio, but you're listening to your president talk, the fireside chat, and then, and then advance more than 20 years. I mean, I know when I was around as, 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 as sm really small, but I was sitting with mom and dad in front of the television watching John F. Kennedy. Now, now, now you have tweets. You don't have to sit with your family to get a tweet or read tweets. You might be sitting by yourself. And depending on who that person is, 
they might be enamored with these tweets. Now, there doesn't seem to be, for the, for, the, for the mass reading these tweets, much in the way of meat in the message. And so, <laughs> and so are, are, are we sitting as a group, as an association, as a family, debating a tweet? Oh, sure, sure. No, tech, no, technology has its good points. Technology has its bad points. Uh, the car has its good points. The car has its bad points. The wagon had a good point. The horse and wagon had a bad point. Of course, the great thing about a wagon, you know, the great thing about a horse instead of a car, if it dies, you can eat it. Can't do that with a car. So everything has its advantages and its drawbacks. In fact, I brought that up because I was watching The Searchers last night with John Wayne, and they were chasing those Indians who took his, his, uh, his nieces. And Harry Carey Jr. He says, we've been chasing these Indians, and he says, he says, if they're a human man at all, they got to stop. He says, it, it, they're, they're, he says, my horse is getting tired. And John Wayne says to him, a Comanche, Command Comanche, a Comanche, We'll pick up that horse you left, ride him another 20 miles, and if you think that horse is dead, the Comanche will bring that, get up that horse, ride him another 20 miles, and then eat him. That's why I brought that up. But the fact of the matter is, technology does have a place, but then again, it's how man uses it. But again, with things like tweets, even your computer, even your television, uh, are, are, are we at many times interacting with other people or our families? Go out to dinner, and I mean, my wife did this not uh, a week or so ago. We're sitting there in a restaurant talking, and there's another couple right next to right next to us. I mean, I could have punched these people, and they're they're not talking. My wife and I were talking. Well, I think I think part of this, getting back to the technology issue, um, I, I I know myself. I I <laughs> I can't watch a lot of television anymore. There is, there is not much going on there, which is why, you know, sometimes I'll even grab my wife and say, okay, Rosemary, let's go. And I'll go to a common council meeting. I'll go to an East Norwalk Association meeting. I'll go to the Coalition of Norwalk Association's meetings. Now, you know, some people say, well, that gets boring. Yeah, but you know what? There is a chance, just a chance, you're with a group that you're going to talk to somebody here. And so, to me, it, 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 you may not agree with what's being delivered here at, at a meeting, but you're not sitting in front of a television set and letting your brain turn to sawdust. At least you are listening to what's going on, and maybe you can be induced into adding something here. Now, granted, yeah, I, you know, again, you go to these meetings, and yeah, they got the televised screen so you can see the people up front who are, who are talking from the Common Council. And you got other people doing this at the meeting too. And that, some of those people doing this are reporters, because I know a couple of them, who are sending what's going on here to the newspaper. Okay, fine. That's technology being used to a good, to a good but not when you're going out to dinner and husband and wife or girlfriend, boyfriend, and they're not talking for 5, 10, 15 minutes they're doing this. Oh, so where is the interaction between people? And this is the problem, perhaps, with technology. And I know, and, you know, and, and at work, I'm, I'm, every once in a while, someone will say, why don't you put that on a thumb drive? Why don't you put it on a disk? You're going gonna to print out the whole damn report? Yeah, I am, and I'm gonna and I'm gonna mark it up just like I did marked up my copy of the Lewis Paul memo. It's going in a file. Well, that's old school. Yeah, but it works. I'll put some of this stuff on discs and thumb drives. I have nothing. I have nothing wrong with that. But I am not gonna divorce myself from the printed word. And to me, that that bugs the heck out of me. It really does. Yes. Uh, you know, uh, I I I agree. I agree a lot with what you're saying, and I think. Having been a Republican at one point, if, I, if, if you could go back and bring back, uh, let's say, a William F. Buckley, 
if he could be on Fox News right now and sit down with somebody like a Sean Hannity, do you honestly think he'd be happy? Do you honestly think he'd be happy? Or with a Rush Limbaugh? Or somebody like this? Do you honestly think? I don't think he would. I don't think he would. Um, I don't think he would. And so have you, going back by what you're saying, have you seen a, cheap, a cheapening of different messages in this country? Yeah, I think you have. Is that, a, is that result of an acceptability of declining standards? Yes. Yes, I think it is. Is it widespread? I think that is. Does that bounce off with your, perhaps what you're saying here about a lack of a societal conscience? No, it is interesting what you're saying, though. But what you're, what you're alluding to here is, in the long run, a breakdown in society. I th did you have a question before? Oh, okay. I thought someone over here had a question. Anyway, anyone else have anything to offer? It's a good discussion, but anything else? Anybody? Yes. Oh, I don't, I don't think Chelsea Clinton is a, uh, I don't think she's a moron. Um... Uh, you know, I, I, there, there, is some, there is something going on between her ears. But to a certain extent, you can understand that when it looks nice for Stanford to have a, a previous president's daughter in, the, in, the, in, in their university. That's a selling point. Well, yeah, but it's also a selling point. But at the same time, when you get people from a privileged group going to virtually the same universities, well, what does that tell you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but then again, you know, when the, something you just threw out here, why are a sizable number of your Supreme Court justices from Yale and Harvard? Well, the upper crust. Right, and then the occasional one from Stanford or someplace like that. Yale's having a tough week. The university or the lock company? Oh, okay, all right. Well, isn't that what George Bush said? I'm, I'm living proof of a C student becoming president? That's what he said. He was nominated by, uh, by Nixon for the Supreme Court. Yeah, he, um, he was, uh, uh, 1989, he his, his tenure ended. He was nominated by Nixon, and I think he got, uh, was it 73? I'd have to double check. I'd have to double check. Um, but, the, I mean, the, the, the document itself is fascinating to read. It truly is. And it might sound, well, this doesn't sound so bad, but it's where it goes from here. You know, it's, it's where, is, 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 is the gist of the message here, getting into the, getting into the universities, into the media, lambasting people like, uh, like uh, Ralph Nader, William Kunstler. But keep in mind, on the face, it says, confidential memorandum to the education chairman of the Chamber of Commerce. Of course, you didn't have the internet then. Now you do. And so when I know some people have read this, you gotta be kidding. I said, no, no, shouldn't be a surprise. Yeah. Um, he wasn't, he really wasn't all, all, the, all that much of a young man. Uh, his exact age, I honestly don't know. I, that I'd have to that I'd have to look look up. Well, uh, well, well. Considering, I mean, he do, it doesn't sound he doesn't he doesn't write. I you know I don't think he's writing as a paranoid here. But at the same point, uh, you know, he is concerned about the state of free market and business, and the free enterprise system as as he elaborates here. And so when you take a look at the country at that point, you know, 1971, um, again, the Vietnam War is not going well, the civil rights movement, and he, he makes no bones about the questioning of capitalism here uh, by academics and the young. So does he think that perhaps business in the free market system are, are being beleaguered here under siege? Could very well be. Could very well be. Oh, yeah, that, that's... That's the bugaboo. That, that, man is, that man is target number one, Ralph Nader. Yeah, unsafe at any speed, right. 
And, uh, you know, Nader, Nader makes no bones. If you listen to him now, he makes no bones as to what he thinks going on, is going on now. And he's not, he's not a fan of either Democrats or Republicans. That, well, that America's a corporate state. And he has, and he does applaud some Democrats for moving more to the left. He says you have to have a functioning left to offset the right, which is what we don't have. Well, that's how you got to the middle at one point. At least somebody compromised. Well, I mean, I'm sure, you, I'm sure some of us are old enough to remember when Reagan would call up Tip O'Neill after a while. Hey, look, why don't we sit down and have a lunch or whatever the case may be and see what we can come up with here. And they did that. And at one point, 1797, 1798, Federalists on one side and Democrat Republicans on the other. And again, that led to the, uh, because of the Alien and Sedition Acts, for one thing. But we've had those periods where, <laughs> the, the, if you want to use two major party system, <laughs> but then again, you know, you, you, you get somebody like Reagan and, and O'Neill, hey, look, what do we got to do to straighten this out here? Okay, they get together and have a chat. And the two brokers, if you want to use that term, oh. Well, it, I guess at that point it worked. You know, now we got this settled, let's move on. Oh, well, maybe some of that, maybe it has that's something to do with McCain's death. Um, maybe. Uh, uh, you know, M M McCain was one of those guys who, uh, of course, he wasn't the only one who would commiserate with people on the other side of the aisle. Well, keep in mind the, the, the pressures he's under eh. uh, from certain organizations and societies and so on and so forth like the Federalist Society a lot of those people aren't yeah but at one point he was really not a fan of Donald Trump because he was establishment well but then again how bona fide is that yeah, yeah but again how bona fide is that we don't know well somebody just said it doesn't matter but then again, how how really how bona fide or how or how, how you know how bona fide is that? Um, uh, you know, uh, I'll reserve judgment on that one. I wish I could caddy for one of those foursomes. Uh, and you know, not you know, I really could. I wouldn't mind. I wouldn't mind just just to be with an earshot. But you know, I mean, I mean, don't think for one moment that the establishment wouldn't like to dump this guy if they could. I'm not talking Graham, I'm talking you know, the, the expatriate from Queens. That's what I'm talking about. Well, I mean, how much legislation has he really passed? You know, he doesn't want to do press conferences. I can understand why. Uh, that won't go over well. Uh, he's given how many since he's been in? She gave the other one the other day. So, beg your pardon? Yeah, so it's usually the tweets or executive orders, and executive orders and tweets apparently appeal to that base. Some of that base who apparently have lost the uh, respect for representative government, which is bouncing off what this young lady over here was alluding to earlier about a consciousness of the society. And there is something to that. Uh, so in two weeks, I'll be back here starting the revolt of the planters. I'm going to be doing that. That is a political look at the Civil War. And the first week is going to be about ownership of property, the Jeffersonian versus the Hamiltonian doctrines, and where that goes from here. And it irks me that we really, when we discuss the Civil War, the political attributes of this conflict, or as I call it, the revolt of the planters, because to me that's exactly what this was, this idea of this Confederate revolution, which was from the right, and it lacked a lot of democratic precepts. Slavery is not a democratic precept. And so this idea of states' rights, I believe, is somewhat overblown. And I'm going to go into this. Now, the first week will be, a lot of it will be, 
importance of property, the Jeffersonian versus the Hamiltonian outlook. And then the second week will be a, will dissect the Southern aristocracy. To me, that's what that was. And who oversaw uh, what I like to call a slaveocracy. Uh, maybe not in the, in the direct, in, you know, a direct comparison to feudalism, um, at least those people, yeah, um, uh, or this idea of cottonism. Now, you could throw out that word if you want, but to me, this is what you're looking at here. And then I'm going to go into the Confederate state and so on and so forth and explain why this is a revolution from the right. So, anyway, that's it. Have a good night.